turned in rebellion against his creator and sought to make himself equal with God. Very interesting, we have a comparison between Lucifer on the one hand and Jesus on the other. Lucifer was a created being not equal with God. He sought equality with God and fell. Concerning Jesus, it says in Philippians chapter 2, he did not think equality with God something to be grasped. He had it by divine right. But he humbled himself and God exalted him. Now let's look at this little picture here. Beginning in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, morning star? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? Now we get the motivation of Lucifer's rebellion. <laughs> and in the following verses, we get the phrase, I will, five times. It's the will of the future set against the will of, the will of God. The key word is rebellion. For well, you have said in your heart, and remember that God knows what we say in our heart. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'm going up. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend. You notice the whole thing is going up. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The most high is the almighty God. And the word means also, I will be equal to God. But Satan's ambition was to elevate himself to a position of equality with God. And he, he was motivated because he was so wise and so beautiful and so glorious that he said to himself, well, I could be God. My personal opinion, and this is just an opinion, is that he motivated the angels who were under his charge to join in and rebellion. And I just picture this, if you can imagine this kind of thing going on in heaven. And it, all this started in heaven. Believe it or not, it did. I can imagine going around to the angels that were under his charge and think, you really have come. You're unusually gifted. But God doesn't really appreciate all that you have. But if I were in charge, I'd give you the position that you really deserve. Uh, and uh, apparently, again, this is not necessary, it's a matter of instance, he undermined the loyalty of one third of the angels to God and drew them with him in his rebellion and in his fall. And so God says, You shall be cast down to the sides of the pit. Let us look also in Ezekiel chapter 28 where we get another picture of this same remarkable being. Ezekiel chapter 28 has got two sections. The, each of them is a lamentation or a pronouncement of woe. The first is on the prince of fire. The second is on the king of fire. Now, if you study the chapter in detail, which we do not have time to do, you find that the prince of Tyre was a human being. Very clearly stated he was a man, even though he claimed to be God. On the other hand, it's very obvious as we read the description of the king of Tyre that he was no human being. And we have here a little interesting picture of how Satan's kingdom operates. We have the human ruler, the prince of Tyre, but behind him, in the unseen realm, we have the satanic ruler, the king of Tyre. And in a sense, the human ruler is really not much more than a puppet. He moves as the strings from the unseen realm dictate his mood. When you begin to see these truths, history and politics take on a very different meaning. I think many, many great, so-called great men of history were simply satanic puppets who were moved by invisible strings from the kingdom of Satan to do the things they did. Anyhow, let's look at a little of what 
the word of God says to this second being, beginning in Ezekiel 28, verse 12, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. A totally glorious, resplendent being. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you created. Also, a master musician. Now, there are quite a lot of Bible teachers who believe that Satan, let's say Lucifer, he hadn't changed his name then, Lucifer was responsible for orchestrating the worship of heaven. I think it's important to know that Satan, as he is today, knows a lot about music. And he knew, uses music as one of his means to captivate people. Going on in verse 14, You were the anointed cherub who covered, who covers one, the throne of God. See, the scripture makes it so plain that there is a cherub, or there are cherubs, who with their outstretched wings cover the very throne of God. What a position of honor, glory. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. This is no human being, you can see that. You were perfect in your way from the day you were created. God reminds you, you were created. You were not God, you were created to you. You were perfect in the way in, in your way from the day you were created till in iniquity was found in I prefer to use the word rebellion. <clears throat> till you became a rebel. <clears throat> and then we read in verse 16, by the abundance of your trading. Now, the same word in the book of Proverbs is used of a tailbearer. It's used of a trader because the trader goes to and fro presenting his wares and selling them. But it's used as a tail bearer because a tail bearer goes to and fro selling tails. Now that's why my thought is that Satan went around the heaven his angels. Well, see, if, if, if I had that position, you'd really be appreciated. I mean, I would promote you would get the, the authority that you really deserve. So that's just my opinion. But let's say by the abundance of your manipulation, your scheming, your plotting, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stone. That is the that. What does the therefore indicate? God's judgment on rebellion. And then we get the real motivation of Satan, of Lucifer. Let's call him Lucifer till he becomes Satan. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. What was the initial motivation of Satan? What was the first sin? Pride. We need to remember that always. The first sin in the universe took place in heaven, not on earth. It wasn't drunkenness. It wasn't adultery. It wasn't even lying. It was pride. And believe me, it's still far the most deadly and dangerous of all things. And lots of churchgoers who wouldn't commit adultery or get drunk are very easily enticed into pride and don't even realize how dangerous it is. Now, I want to deal with a question that comes up in many people's minds. They say, well, if Satan was cast out of heaven, how can it be that he's still in the heavens? The answer is very simple. There's more than one heaven. The heavenlings are plural. In the first verse of the Bible, heaven is presented as plural. In the beginning, God created the heavenly form, the earth kingdom. If you trace it all through the Bible, heaven is presented as glory. We'll just look at two scriptures. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Paul is talking about people who had remarkable experiences in the supernatural realm. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now, before I became a preacher, I was a logist. Somebody once said to me, say, I was a magician, but that's not true. And uh, logic is still stuck with my logical mind tells me if there's a third heaven, there has to be a third heaven. You cannot have a third of anything without the third too. So if there is a third heaven, of course, then there are at least three heavens. Heaven is glory. One of the scriptures just to confirm that is Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 9 and 10, speaking about what happened between the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection and ascension. It says, Now this, he, he asked them, What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? This is talking about Jesus. He also who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens. That he might fill all things. Notice the phrase, all the heavens. Again, it is not correct to use the word all. Less than three of anything. Less than minimum. When I was, years ago, when I was principal of the college for training African teachers in Kenya, one of my parents, one of my students came to me and said, All my parents have come to see me. So I said, I understand what you mean, but you can't say that because in English, Jesus descended far above all heavens. Again, the minimum that will qualify is three. Personally, I think that's the that's the point. That's my personal opinion. You do hear people say sometimes, not so often these days, I was in the seventh heaven. Uh, I would suggest you probably better not use that. I understand the phrase comes from the Quran, the Islamic book, and I don't think there's any. Biblical authority for more than three heavens. So if you're feeling really happy, it's all right to say I was on cloud nine. Because the Bible indicates there's a lot of clouds. Uh, now I'll offer you an opinion. This is simply something that seems probable to me. You don't have to believe it. You can go to heaven without agreeing with me. But, uh, make it there sooner than I do. Uh, I believe the third heaven into which this man that Paul knew was caught up is the heaven of God's presence, God's dwelling. And there it says he heard unspeakable words, the very words of God himself. Now I, I'm inclined to believe the first heaven is the visible heaven that we see. So the second must be between the first and the third, somewhere between our planet and the heaven of God's dwelling, there is another heaven. This is, again, my opinion. I think there are a lot of things in the Bible that concern it and in our experience. So between us and God is a satanic kingdom. I think this has got a lot to do with things that happen in our lives. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, praying through. Praying through what? I know when I first sought the Lord, as a person who didn't know him, I tried to pray for an hour. I couldn't utter a word. Yet I was earnestly seeking. And then somehow I broke through. I believe, looking back, I broke through satanic forces that were opposing me coming into direct personal contact with me. That was the turning point in my own life. So, don't laugh at the old-time Pentecostals who talk about praying through. Their, some of their methods may be a little...